Well, it's a new year. Um, I didn't stay up. I've been pretty worn out. I drove back from Washington by myself uh, in a car with no radio and no cruise control, 2,000 miles. And I drove. And one day I drove from Boise, Idaho to Oklahoma City. It was, it was a pretty long drive. Uh, but I made it. And so I'm still kind of, kind of out of it. And so I went to bed last night and ushered in the new year by sleeping. I think that was a good choice. Um, but with the new year comes, you know, a lot of people view it as kind of a fresh start, a way to, to start anew, make some goals, make some resolutions, some things to shoot for. And I think that's a good thing for us to do as a church as well. Uh, I have grown up in smaller churches my, most of my life. The time we lived in, uh, in Dallas-Fort Worth was an exception, and we went to a larger church then. But I have spent most of my life in smaller churches. And one of the things that puzzles me, and it, it didn't occur to me at the time, but now as a pastor, it, it occurs to me that I never once heard um, like a, a long-term goal or even a, a year-long goal. Most often it was just like, well, we're going to do VBS this summer and we're going to do VBS next summer. And that was about the extent of the, the long-term plan. So I want us to look at some goals for 2012, some goals, and even some goals that stretch beyond 2012, maybe three to five years out, something that we can, we can look at, that we can aim for, uh, that we can shoot for as a church. But before we do that, uh, you know, we've got we've to have scripture. It's not, a, it's not Sunday unless we look at some scripture. So open up your Bibles to the last chapter of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28, and we are going to look for just a few minutes here before I talk about our goals at the Great Commission. Why the Great Commission? Why, why look at that today? Well, because ultimately it's from this commission that these goals and these resolutions are going to flow out of. Um, let me read it for us. It's Matthew chapter 28, and it starts in verse 19. Jesus said, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, what's the command in this text? What's the command? Which, is, it, uh, is it baptize? Is it go? What's the command? The command is make disciples. The command is make disciples. In, in other words, that's like our mission statement as Christians and as a church is to make disciples. Now, where are the disciples supposed to come from? This is where the, the, the go element comes in. Well, they were supposed to come from everywhere. Where did, where did this start out? Remember how it all kind of started out small? You just had, you had Jesus and then he called these 12 men to come and be his closest friends, be his closest followers. And it started out with them, and then they went into Jerusalem, and there was an incredible moving of the Spirit in Jerusalem at Pentecost, and then persecution pushed the church out, and Paul and Peter, and they go out on these missionary journeys, spreading out into all the world. But it all started right there in Jerusalem. Now, what's interesting about this command you remember that Jesus and his disciples, they were all Jewish. They were all Jewish. And so this command forced the disciples to get out of their comfort zone. If they'd had their way, they would have only gone to other people just like them, other Jewish people. That was their comfort zone. In fact, the, it, traditionally Jewish people in the uh, New Testament age viewed the Gentiles as second-class citizens. And they didn't want anything to do with them. You remember the story of the Good Samaritan? Nobody expected the Samaritan to do good, but he was the one who did good anyway. And so this command, just like it required the disciples to step out of their comfort zones, even Peter struggled with this. We talked about Peter's struggles with, uh, with legalism in er the early parts of Galatians, but it required them to get out of their comfort zones. It required them to leave that, that comfortable area of Jerusalem spread out into the world and share the gospel with all people. I mean, just, 
Just look at our example. Who's our ultimate example? Jesus Christ. What kind of people did he hang out with? Tax collectors and sinners. The dregs of society. Those were the people that he reached out to. In verses 19 and 20, we see um, how you make disciples. So the command is to make disciples. How do we go about doing that? You go, you baptize, and you teach. These are those, the elements that come into play when making disciples. And so to make disciples as a church, we've got to be willing to go. Uh, for, the, for the disciples, for Jesus' disciples, this meant that they had to leave that mountaintop where Jesus was giving the Great Commission, and they had to spread out into the world. They couldn't just sit there. They couldn't just stay there and, you know, look up into the clouds and meditate on what Jesus had told them. They had to actually leave that comfortable place and go out into the world. Same thing we've got to be willing to do. We can't just come in here to the church and hope and pray that some random person who doesn't know Jesus is going to walk through the doors. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. We have to step outside of our comfortable church, our comfort zone in this church with our Christian friends and our Christian family, and we have to go out into our secular jobs and our secular world and our secular, just the environment in general, and we have to take Jesus out there with us. We have to be willing to go. And that's, some people say, well, that's, that's, that's missionaries, right? No, no, that's not just missionaries. That's each and every single one of us. We've got to be willing to go, to leave the comfort zone of our church, go out into our community, go out into our everyday lives, taking the gospel of Jesus Christ with us. Um, very briefly, baptize. Why is this important? Uh, obviously, as Baptists, we view baptism as very important. Baptism is a public profession of conversion. It lets all of us know, it lets all of us be a part of that conversion in that we hold them accountable now. Somebody is baptized and they're saying, I am a Christian and I expect you to hold me accountable to that. That's why baptism is important. <clears throat> and finally, a disciple of Jesus Christ has to be taught. I don't know if, uh, if you realize this, but when someone gets saved, they don't automatically know everything. Um, I wish that had been the case with me, then I would not have gone to school for eight years uh, to, to be a pastor. If I'd, I just wish that it, it would have just all come automatically when I became a Christian. But unfortunately, that was not the case, and I did have to go to school for eight years. Um, but conversion does not automatically give a person everything they need to know about the Christian life. They have to be taught now, whose responsibility is that? It's our responsibility. It's my responsibility. As a, as a pastor, it's my responsibility to equip you, to teach you, uh, so that you can go out into your jobs and into your life with the gospel. And so when Jesus saves a person, it's the responsibility of us as a church, every single one of us in the church, not just the pastor, not just the Sunday school teachers, to equip and teach people, to disciple them. Now, too often, when a person gets saved, we just want to dunk them in the baptistry and then send them back to the pew and hope they figure it out on their own. But that's not how it works. They, a new Christian, they need to be discipled. Someone needs to come alongside them, show them God's Word, teach them the foundational Christian doctrines. This is why we're doing the Christian Doctrine series coming up uh, in March is when we're going to start it. Because we've got to know these things. You've got to know these things so that when a new Christian comes in, you can come alongside them and say, this is what you need to know. This is what you have to believe to be a Christian. Otherwise, they're just going to go along being a nominal, barely there Christian. And we do not want that. We do not want that. This is a world that is increasingly hostile to our faith. And if people aren't grounded in doctrine, if people aren't uh, committed to Jesus Christ with all their life, then it's altogether too easy to just say, nah, I don't want anything to do with that. So what does this mean? How, how, what does this mean for us as a church? How do we accomplish this? How do we do this teaching? Well, there's some things that we need to do. Uh, it means that you as church members have to be willing to, to put down the the popular magazines, the, the latest fiction, um, 
even some very poor theological books found in Christian bookstores, and you've got to dig into the Word, dig into the Bible primarily. Uh, periodically, I will recommend books to you that will help you, that will uh, help deepen your, your understanding of, of the Bible and of doctrine. You've got to be willing to learn yourself, and you have to do that more than just on Sunday morning. It's got to be a lifestyle. It's got to be something where you're spending time doing it every day, every week, devoted to it, committed to it. And the primary thing in that always is reading your Bible, digging into the text of Scripture. And that's why when I preach, I preach from a text. I, that's what, what's so important. This is, this is our, our, our uh, manual. This is what teaches us how to live life. This is what teaches us um, the gospel, the story of Jesus, salvation. And so ultimately, these goals that I've prayed about and have wrestled with and spent a lot of time coming up with are all rooted in the Great Commission. As a church, I want everything that we do to be about glorifying God and fulfilling the Great Commission. And so, um, I hope you, as you came in back there by the bulletins, there was a sheet of paper, and I hope you grabbed one. If not, grab one on your way out. Um, and it's just listed. It's the exact same thing I have up here. And I'm just going to go down this list with you and talk a little bit about them. And... Uh, We'll go from there. Um, we just had uh, our Lottie Moon goal met, which I'm super excited about, $1,500. That's awesome. Um, and so we're, we're, we're uh, I've been very impressed that we are, we're a giving church. We support missions. And so I think that uh, one of the, the primary ways that we can support the Great Commission is through our finances, through our giving. And so one of the things that I would like to see us do is when we make our next budget, I'd like to see us increase our budgeted missions giving 1% each line item. That means our cooperative giving goes from 7 to 8%, associational giving from 5 to 6%, and uh, giving for missions events from 4 to 5%. And so, so what does that do? I mean, what does the cooperative program do? How many of you know what the cooperative program is? You know what it is, know what it does. This is one of the hallmarks of Southern Baptist life, the cooperative program. And I just got this in the mail this week uh, randomly, and I'm going to share a little bit with you. It basically lays out what the cooperative program does. This is why your tithes and your offerings are so important. They get multiplied time and time over. Uh, step one. You give your gift to the church, your tithes and your offerings to the church. And then, if I can figure this thing out, they kind of made it complicated. In step two, you have your church and your community. Your tithes and your offerings, most of that goes right into the church, right into the community. Um, that's why when we lay out our budget, it goes to buy Sunday school materials, it goes for outreach, uh, it goes to help people in the church who are in need. So the your tithes and offerings, the majority of them stay right here, right in the church. In the third step, the Kansas-Nebraska Convention. That's our, our, uh, our state convention. Kansas and Nebraska join together, form us a state convention. And a portion of our cooperative program gifts, that 7 to 8% to 8 increase that I'd like to see, goes to the Kansas-Nebraska Convention. And so that goes to... Uh, helping statewide events like in debt. Did you know when you give in your offering, you're helping uh, our youth go to these wonderful events like in depth? It's helping with uh, disaster relief. That's what your offerings are doing. And so a portion of what you give goes to the Kansas Nebraska Convention. A portion of what you give goes to help seminaries. Uh, I was able to go to seminary because churches just like this, because people just like you give your offerings. My seminary education cost about half what it would if I'd gone to a non-Baptist entity because of the cooperative program. And so by giving your tithes and your offerings, 
you are helping train up the next generation of missionaries and pastors and music leaders. That's what your tithes and your offerings are doing. A portion of your gift, your tithe and your offering, will go to the North American Mission Board for church planting, for missions right here in North America. And then a portion of it will go to the International Mission Board where missionaries are sent out all across the world. That's what that cooperative program line item is for. That's pretty neat that your tithes and your offerings multiplied with the gifts of thousands of Baptist churches all across the country together do all of this. So think about that. I think that's worth it. I think that's worth an extra 1%. And what that looks like in total dollar amount for the year is a total dollar amount of $2,700. $2,700, 3% increase in the budget, all to missions. I think that's a very worthy goal. I think that's worth giving up, uh, you know, a lunch on Sunday where you'd normally eat out to put that in the offering plate so that more people can hear the gospel, so that more pastors can be trained in seminary. I think it's worth more than a quarter pounder. I think the money is probably the easier thing. It's easy enough to put a little extra money on that check. This next one, I think it's a little harder. I'd like us to have a 10% increase in our average Sunday morning worship attendance. These are goals. These are resolutions. These are things for each of us to work towards. What does that look like practically? That means 6 to 10 new members. 6 to 10 new members. A couple of families. I think that is very doable. Um, In the, the newsletter that the South Central Association sends out, the one they sent out most recently, Tom Edwards said that uh, only around 1% of people in this area are in church on any given Sunday. 1%. So I think 6 to 10 is very, very doable for us as a church. What that means practically is that you go out into your jobs, you go out into your, your circles of influence, and you are attentive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. When opportunities arise to share the gospel, to invite people to church, to bring people into our fellowship, you jump on that opportunity. Don't pass the buck thinking somebody else will do it. Each one of you touches so many lives when you go out into the community. I mean, if you were to take the amount of people that each person touches in this church right now, it would be astounding. And a lot of those people aren't involved in church. So 10% increase in our average Sunday morning worship attendance. Six to ten people is probably what that would look like practically. Um, We're going to begin Sunday evening services. I haven't set a date for this yet, but it's just going to be a a pretty relaxed, casual time focused primarily on deepening scriptural knowledge. Maybe we'll explore some other topics that we wouldn't usually talk about on a Sunday morning like church history. It's going to be about you know, building us as Christians, deepening that knowledge, getting us to where we're more comfortable with our faith and, and uh, sharing it with other people. So we're going to begin Sunday evening services soon this year. I'll, I'll keep you updated on that. Um, an increased focus on local missions. And this is going to tie right in to the increase in average worship attendance. This will primarily be a result of you all going out into the community, going out uh, into your everyday lives. You you see a need, you bring it to the church, and we can help meet those needs. Uh, This is partly where our our missions events budget comes in. You know, we we have the resources to help people. And when people come into the church, sometimes uh, they get help directly, sometimes they get sent to Joseph's storehouse. And we also support Joseph's storehouse. Um, but be attentive to those needs. You know, that's, that's one of the ways that we reach out to people. Uh, some people are just there to take advantage of, of a helping hand. But some people will see that, and they'll remember it, and they'll say, you know, those people are really serious about what they believe. And so it's important that we pay attention to needs in our community, that we reach out into our community through local missions, our youth, 
uh, go out and get food for Joseph's storehouse. And that's just, you know, little things like that, being a presence in our community. Um, this is a big one. This is one of my uh, pet projects, if you will. Men, I want to see you becoming more and more involved in this church and primarily in the spiritual lives of your home. I have high expectations for you. I know you're capable of a lot. Um, there's a pastor that I, I listen to his sermons sometimes, and he coined this term called Pastor Dad. Pastor Dad. You know what that means? That means, fathers, that you are the primary source of spiritual guidance and theological knowledge for your family. Not me. That's not my job. I'm not supposed to be the primary source of spiritual knowledge and theological knowledge for your family. That's supposed to be your job, fathers. And so I want to see you, and I have this expectation of you, men, that you will be involved in this church, that you will be involved in the spiritual lives of your families, taking the lead on that. One of the ways that uh, we're doing this practically in our house is I found a book that is short devotionals. I've never, I, when I was growing up, we tried to do family devotions, and it always ended up being pretty awkward. Um, but we're going to try it in our house this year. Liam's pretty little, so he, he'll probably interrupt us more than participate. But I found a book that's just 10-minute family devotions. You can do that when you sit down for dinner. Instead of going and, and sitting in front of the TV, sit down at the table while you're eating. Just spend 10 minutes going over a, a, a scripture verse. I think that's a, a very doable thing. And that's one way that men, dads, you can take the lead in being the spiritual leader of your family. That is your role. That is your biblical role. Um, Men, I want to see you taking the lead in this church. Uh, when, when needs arise, step up. Volunteer. When a Sunday school class needs a new teacher, step up. Volunteer. I know there's some guys out there who can teach the, who can teach the kids too. I know there's some guys out there who can work in the nursery too. It's not just for the ladies, men. This is our church. We need to take the lead. We need to take responsibility. And that is my expectation for you, is that you will be involved in this church, that you will take the lead in getting your family out the door to church, making it a priority, that when Sunday evening services start, you will take the lead and say, that's important, we're going to be there. So be involved. Take the lead. Read those books. Study the, the, the doctrine book that... Uh, we're going to be going through here in a couple months. Use that as a, a, a jumping off point to be the spiritual leader in your family. That's my expectation of you, men. I don't care whether you're 20 or whether you're 80. <coughs> Finally, we're going to make discipleship our overarching goal as a church. This goes from all the way from our, our youngest kids in the nursery all the way up to our oldest senior adults. It's all going to be about discipleship because as a church, this is where we so often fail. We're happy to baptize. We're happy to teach. We're even happy to go. But when it comes to doing the long, hard work of taking a Christian, a young Christian, and walking with them to maturity, we fail at that. That's why so often you see, uh, you see young people, you see teenagers who go from youth group, go off to college, and then they never darken the door of the church again. Maybe they'll come back when they get married and have kids. Maybe. But too often there's a decade in there of lost spiritual growth and opportunity. Why? Because they were fed a shallow diet of milk all throughout their childhood and youth group days. We have to be willing as a church to take the harder route and disciple them. That means that those of you who are older and more mature Christians, you take the time and you pour your life and your energy 
into the younger Christians. That's what it's all about. That is discipleship. Now, ultimately, we've got to ask ourselves, is everything we're doing in this church about Jesus, about glorifying Him, about advancing His kingdom? That is our mission as a church. Our mission as a church is not to host fun events. Our mission as a church, uh, it, it's not even VBS, which is a great outreach, but there's nowhere in, in Scripture that says you have to do VBS. If VBS isn't li- yielding disciples, then we're failing at it. Is everything we're doing at a church glorifying Jesus? bringing glory to Him? Is it all about Him? That needs to be our goal, our mission as a church and as individual Christians. And every time we make a decision as a church in a business meeting or whatever, we need to ask ourselves, is this advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ? Is our expenditure of resources here somehow advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ? And finally, is Jesus worthy of our best efforts and our sacrifices? I think so. I think he is. That's why I think all of this is very doable because we serve an incredibly powerful God. We serve an incredibly powerful God. And Jesus Christ is worthy of our efforts and our energies and, yes, our sacrifices in order to bring glory to him in order to advance the gospel. There's also some long-term goals here. Three to five years, looking out a ways. It all starts with these short-term goals. But with these short-term goals, if we can start incorporating these into the life of our church, then we can work towards these long-term goals. First, we need to have a strong theological core. That can be every single one of you sitting here, part of that strong theological core where you are committed to the gospel, where you are spiritually mature, theologically mature, where you are committed to this church. That means you're a part of the church, you're, uh, you're taking part, you're volunteering, you're uh, supporting the church through your tithes and your offerings. That's all part of the strong spiritual core that this church needs to have. We have a wonderful group of deacons right now but they are not always going to want to be deacons. Um, there's going to be, so there's going to be a need to have people step up into that role. Deacons need to be spiritually mature, theologically mature, and committed to the church. And so, those of you who are younger men, this is why it is important that you start working on this and developing this because you are going to be the next deacons. This is why... It's so important that you be involved in the church, that you make it important and a priority for your family because you are the next generation of leaders in this church. Said this is long term. This is a big one. I'd like to see us reach a regular attendance of 100 plus people on Sunday mornings. Three to five years. That 10% number that I put out for this year extrapolate that out over three to five years, and that's very, very doable. You look at the number of people in this community, and that's very, very doable. It's very easy as a a church to get into a mindset that we've always been this size for decades, and it's always going to be that way. Not true. Not true. We serve a powerful God. We're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. I think there are wonderful Wonderful. There's wonderful potential for this church in this community. Wonderful potential for growth. So three to five years, a worship attendance of 100 plus people. That would pack out this place pretty regularly. That would be just awesome to see these pews filled with no gaps. Even back there where there's not much leg room and it's like an airline flight. That, that would just be awesome. Um, in the, also in the latest associational newsletter that uh, Tom Edwards sent out, he mentioned the, the, the huge need for church plants in this part of the country. There's just not a lot of Southern Baptist churches in this area. Uh, and so there's a, a need for there to be church plants. And as our church grows towards 100 people, then we can start looking 
at how we can support that directly, whether that means planting a church offshoot of this one, partnering with another church to plant a church somewhere. That is a vital need, and that is one of the primary ways that we can reach out and influence our community and our area by putting a church where it's desperately needed. And I'd like to see us plan a major mission trip. Um, could be domestic, could be international, something where we go somewhere outside of our comfort zone and we help people and we share the gospel. Um, this is something that we can plan well in advance. These tend to be expensive, cost prohibitive, but if it's planned well in advance, then funds can be raised so that all who want to participate can. Uh, maybe we could even partner with another church, partner with an association to make it happen. But that is all about fulfilling the Great Commission. Go, make disciples, baptize, teach. We are in a, a wonderful position as a church. We are financially sound. We have a wonderful group of deacon leadership. We have great volunteers. We have all the pieces here. But are we going to take the next step? And that involves each and every single one of you being willing to do that, being willing to give that extra little bit on your tithe and in your offerings, maybe starting tithing. Maybe you don't do it, but you should because your tithes and your offerings just multiply to support the spread of the gospel from everywhere, from right here in this community to the deepest, darkest parts of the world. But it all starts with us. It all starts with you being willing to make that commitment. Are you willing to make that commitment? I think each of these resolutions, each of these goals is very doable. But we won't be able to do them if you're not committed to it. And I think our Savior is worthy of our commitment. I think our Savior is worthy of our sacrifice. Look what he did. This is very small compared to that. So there you have it. A new year, New Year's resolutions. Many of you made them for your own lives. Now we have them for us as a church. Uh, there's copies of this back there by the bulletins. Grab a copy on your way out. Take it. Pray about it. Uh, let the Holy Spirit lead you to see how you can help grow this church, how you can help uh, spread the gospel in this community and in this world. That's our mission, church. If we're not doing that, we might as well close the doors and go home. And that's the truth. And we're going to have a time of invitation now. And, you know, if you just feel the, the Holy Spirit working in you, uh, convicting you about something, and you just want to come forward and pray, please feel free. That's what the time of invitation is for. It's not just for somebody who's never known Jesus. Come forward. Let us join you in prayer. Let us pray with you. Um, let's go ahead and have our invitation.